Dementia is a problem worldwide. The most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is marked by the presence of aggregates of toxic tau and amyloid beta proteins. Using neuroimaging techniques, we can actually see inside the brain and see where these aggregates are. And doing experiments in animals has actually given us a great amount of insight into how Alzheimer's disease progresses. But we can't do these experiments in humans due to ethics constraints. And the resolution of the neuroimaging techniques that we have are limited. As a result, the, the mathematics community, uh, especially here at Oxford, has stepped up in order to fill the gap and allow for this critical research to be done in humans using scientific computing and mathematical analysis. So my work at the Mathematical Institute leverages network models of dynamical systems that recapitulate the primary mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease pathology. These systems also use large network graphs which capture the structure of the human brain. So using these network techniques, we can model the propagation of Alzheimer's disease at a very high resolution, and we can even couple these mathematical models to um, statistical inference techniques in order to allow us to determine your patient-specific parameters in the models and to predict how Alzheimer's disease might progress in your specific brain. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Kamilova, and I just recently finished my PhD here at the University of Oxford in Applied Mathematics. I've always been passionate about um, how mathematics can be useful for companies, and I was very fortunate that my project did just that. My project was, this was with this company called Elkem in Norway, and they have this uh, piece of equipment, this electrode, a large seven meter length, two meter diameter electrode, that when it works fine, it powers their entire, entire production. However, when it doesn't work fine, then it can break and cause a lot of um, issues for the company. So it was my job to use mathematics and try to understand why these electrodes would break. And I did that using mathematical modeling techniques and in particular asymptotic analysis, which is this very cool part of mathematics that helps us write um, simplified models that have an actual very complicated physical um, interpretation. So it's, it's kind of a very neat trick to write mathematical models. Uh, one problem that I focused on was the cylinder addition problem. So in these electrodes, uh, they work because of the raw material inside them, which is called paste. It's added as a solid cylinder at the top, and then it slowly softens and flows as you move downwards in the electrode metal casing. And it changes its viscosity based on temperature changes. So I focused on the very top part where the cylinders are softened. So when they deform until they reach the casing. And it turns out that that point, so where it reaches the casing for the first time, is essential in understanding why the electrodes break sometimes. And in, my, in this specific project, I looked at how adding cylinders changes the position of that point. And in particular, we found that more cylinders at the top is better for the operation of the electrodes than having fewer than necessary. This is just one of the a few models that I did for, for the company as part of my project. Hello, I'm Roy, a final year DFL student working on additive combinatorics. Very broadly speaking, my work focuses on the structure of subsets of the integers. I spent plenty of time on obtaining estimates concerning certain arithmetic properties, which are normally related to interesting sets from number theory. One of the most famous results used in my thesis is about the distribution of the prime seen arithmetic progressions. It's shown by Dirichlet over a hundred years ago that there are infinitely many primes that are congruent to a module D whenever A and D are co-prime. Nevertheless, 
the number of primes in this progression, which is which are less than or equal to x, where x is not very large in terms of the common difference d, is related to the generalized Riemann hypothesis, perhaps one of the most famous conjectures in number theory. What makes me really enjoy my problems is that the proofs typically involve combinatorics, number theory, and perhaps more surprisingly, harmonic analysis, which itself is probably more well known for its applications in analysis and partial differential equations. My research is about the shape of spaces with curvature bounds. Curvature is a way of measuring the distortion of a space from being flat, and it is ubiquitous in science. In particular, it appears in the Einstein equation of general relativity, and it plays a fundamental role in Hamilton Perelman's solution of the Poincare conjecture and of Tarson's geometry gestion conjecture, which is based on Ricci flow. In particular, curvature appears and plays a role in several scenarios in which there, a, a priori there is no available regularity, such as the regularity which is required to talk about rich curvature in the way we learn about it in the differential geometry courses. And this motivates uh, the, a lot of research which has been done in the last uh, 20, 30, 30, 30 years about the synthetic notions of spaces with the curvature bounds, which is uh, the subject of my research. And once you have uh, a notion of space with curvature bounds, uh, a priori non-smooth, the, the first question that you wonder about is how do these spaces look like? And uh, uh, we would like to compare them with what we are used to, for instance, with the smooth differentiable manifolds. And we would like to understand how regular and how singular they are. In recent uh, joint work with Elia Brouet, who is now a postdoc at the Institute of, of Advanced Studies in Princeton, we, we gave an answer to one of these questions and in particular we proved that uh, the so-called non-smooth spaces with the uh, rich curvature lower bounds have at the very least a well-defined notion of dimension which cannot jump from one portion to another portion of the space and the perspective that you adopted to to prove this theorem is based on a fluid mechanics interpretation of uh, the condition rich curvature bounded from below which was introduced by in seminal works by McCann and independently by Otto and Villani at the end of the 90s. And if you're interested on this, uh, on this, you can find more about it on the research case study. My PhD project at the University of Leeds uh, was looking at the industrial injured printing and specifically the method of drop on demand. For that method, we generate a droplet on demand, so when we want, so a single droplet every time. In this type of uh, application, it's very important to have consistency among the droplets and be precise, both for location and about the volume and the speed of the droplets for every droplet. Inks are getting more and more complex, biomaterials, uh, different type of plastic. So we add, you can see the inks, we add either polymers or surfactants, and that's what my product was. So patterns are like small little guys with a head and a tail, and they normally go to the interface where they rest and they reduce the surface tension, a property of the fluid, which is basically try to occupy, minimize the energy, to minimize the space they get. And you see that when you have water, which is a fluid with high surface tension, and this doesn't like to pinch off of like a nitro box or something. So how we did that, we coupled the fluid dynamics problem of a simple jetting behavior problem with how the surfactants behave, with the like covered by empirical laws that we found with experimentalists. So how they move around this jet and how they actually go to the interface and they reduce that surface tension. So we wanna see how they will affect the general behavior. We did that using mathematical modeling, as I said, coding, so we developed a Fortran code to solve this problem. And we compared these results with uh, high quality experiments at the University of Trenton with the Physics of Fluids Group or we use like high speed cameras and zoom lenses because we talk about like micrometer scales to actually compare this. And we saw very nice agreement, which is very nice and optimistic because we're living at the age now that mathematics are a powerful tool to drive experiments where we can see things mathematically that we cannot do with experiments yet. So we saw different things, we identified regimes that are important to improve the jetty behavior. 
So we really hope that this research will have industry and experiments to move forward.